Um, thanks everybody for coming down at 8.30 on a, on a Wednesday morning. Um, impressive, considering we're in Vegas, so thank you. Um, really good turnout, great to see everybody. Um, just to set the scene for this presentation, this is um, 10 keys to ensure your success of your deployment. Um, this is not a super deep technical session, this is business track. Um, I think in some ways this stuff is more complicated and, and almost more important than some of the technical stuff. Um, the technical stuff is kind of typically right or wrong and you can, you can solve those problems. Uh, a lot of this stuff is about your business and, and culture and your requirements. Um, so hopefully you guys find it useful. I'm really keen to keep this interactive. Um, I'm on this podium here, but I might walk around a bit. It's quite a long room. Um, but just shout stuff out, out or um, if you can, walk up to the mics so that the guys on the recording can get it. If you want to shout, I'll just repeat the questions. So what do I know about this anyway? Why have you come to see me at 8.30? Um, so my name is Tom Vathnot. Um, some of you may have seen me around on Twitter and, and blogs and stuff like that. Um, I'm managing consultant for Modality Systems who are a, um, a system integrator. We do consulting, deployment, support, um, and development on the Link platform and have quite a while. Um, I'm a master and I'm an MVP. I've been an MVP for a few years. So I've been uh, knocking around in this technology for a while, since the OCS days. Um, in, uh, I just called out finance customers there. The last couple of years, I've been working more and more with kind of finance and professional services customers. Um, I call that out just because they have some specific regulatory requirements and that users have specific and quite uh, high expectations. Um, so I see some smiles out there. Um, so that, and we've done you know deployments in those areas. So I, I figure if you can please those guys, then uh, you stand a fighting chance of pleasing everybody else as well. Um, and previously, I worked for five years at a Cisco partner. So I've kind of sat on both sides of the fence, as it were. I've done the call manager stuff and I've done the link stuff. Um, so I can kind of give a, a view on both sides of the fence. So what are we going to cover? Um, well, as, as the title says, 10 areas to consider in doing your deployments. Um, the order doesn't signify the importance in any way. In fact, the different points will be more or less important for you guys, depending on your company and, and your customers. Um, based on real-world experience, as I say, I'm, I'm doing this stuff day in, day out, global deployments, different countries, different verticals. Um, there's, there's about 45 of us at Modality, um, UK and US, so lots of experience in not just the technical stuff, but the user adoption, the training, the ongoing support. Um, and I say it's a, it's a, a, a skill set in its own right, I think. Um, if you guys want to go technical, I, I, I enjoy that as well. Um, I'm on 239 stand, Modality stand, um, for the rest of the day, I think, so by all means, come and grab me afterwards. I'll leave a few cards up here, too, if you want to come and talk. Um, and say, ask questions as we go. So number one, uh, business user buy-in. So we, we all get excited about this technology. I think you have to be somewhat excited to come down to a conference and listen about it for a, the best part of a week. But your job is not the technology. Your job is to improve the lives of your users. Um, and, and that's something that I think we forget about sometimes. We get really excited about conferencing and IM and federation and all this crazy cool stuff. And your business users are just trying to get their job done as efficiently as they can. So that's your job, to enable them. And I think there's a lot in Link that can enable them to do their job a lot better. Um, but that's your job, not deploying out Link. Um, so I think with that in mind, you need to be engaging your users. Uh, link deployments come from all different angles. Um, Usually, though, it's someone IT, typically Exchange, SharePoint teams, Microsoft teams, see this cool stuff, see how it interlinks with Office and, and their applications and, and start pushing it out. Um, it, it's sometimes led by the business, but more often than not, it's led by IT. Um, hi, guys, just grab a seat anywhere. Um, so bearing in mind it's from IT, you need to get that business user engagement. Um, early engagement and, and often engagement is the thing. And, and not up and down the business, not just kind of guys at, at the lower levels and not just execs. Um, execs are interesting because often it's hard to get airtime with those guys. But if you can find influencers within your business and show them the cool stuff, show them the federation, show them the iPad stuff, you can get a business sponsor 
that will give you a lot of traction to push your message throughout the business. Um, so do aim as, as high as you think you can in terms of, of uh, executive sponsorship um, within your businesses. Um, supporting the cultural change, it, it's a, a different way of working, Link. If you, if you come in and you try and say you had a PBX phone and now you've got a Link phone, you're going to miss the point somewhat um, with the users because the Link phone might not do everything their PBX phone did. It will certainly do it differently to the way their PBX phone did. So you have to support the users in a cultural change to understand, well, yes, you can have a, a Link, Polycom, Snom, IP phone, but actually look at the client, understand you can just snap up to a conference, you can do your meetings uh, through Outlook calendaring, you can see presence through the office applications. It's supporting the, the change to a kind of collaborative culture within the business where Link adoption really starts to fly. Um, measuring success and gathering feedback. That, that's so important, particularly if it's an IT-led project. Um, it's all well and good talking to your business saying Link's great, but it's so much more powerful when you can go back to the business and say, do you realize we're doing like 100,000 IMs a week or we're doing XYZ minutes of conferencing or XYZ minutes of video? Uh, all that stuff is in, in the monitoring server. So A, make sure you deploy that monitoring server role um, get that QoE data. It's all pretty um, kind of SQL reporting services reports. You pull that stuff out and take that back to the business and say, look, we've been rolling for a, a month now and we're already doing this much IM. Um, the other thing that's uh, really cool is use that data um, to look at who your power users are and what they're doing and go back to those guys and say, hey, I see you're really heavily using conferencing. Can I just have five minutes of your time to understand what you're doing with that and why that's powerful for you? Take those stories and spin them back into the business. Because sometimes people don't get this stuff until they see a peer or a, a member of a team in a different country or whatever it is, someone they relate to saying, oh, actually, you should give these guys some time. There's, there's a lot of value in this technology. IT and telecoms buy in. So I've just said that IT usually lead these projects. Um, so it's a funny thing to say IT and telecoms buy in. Um, the, the reality is, in most orgs, these are still two different teams. Certainly in all the companies I work in, they're two different teams. Um, if the project comes from IT, it, it doesn't necessarily come from all of IT. It usually comes from a subset of IT. So you still need to get the whole of IT on board. But even more so, you need telecoms buy in. There's no getting around that. And, and it's a tricky scenario because essentially you're displacing their favored platform probably ultimately, but probably not day one and probably not straight away. And that's the key thing. You need those two environments interoperate and you're going to need those PBX guys at a minimum bought into the fact that they're going to do some kind of interop with you. If you deploy Link and it's completely isolated to the PBX, you're going to get limited traction with users because they're used to dialing extensions to different uh, regions, for example, or they're used to um, being able to make PSDN calls straight out and they can't on Link, but they can on the PBX. You create a disjointed experience. So you need to have the telecoms team buy in to at least interoperate with you while you're doing the Link deployment. Um, in an ideal world, you have those telecom guys on board, with the, particularly with the gateway technologies, with the SIP trunk, the ISDN, all the stuff you need to make the, the PSDN stuff work. That's their area of expertise. Um, if you've got a, a telecoms team that understands SIP, so much more the better. Uh, unfortunately, that's fairly rare. Um, but there's a massive opportunity, and, and it's not like the, some of the skills that those guys have got suddenly go away. It's, it's still a very important thing to understand all the gateway stuff, all the ISDN stuff. Um, if you can get those guys bought into the success of Link, you'll have a much smoother ride. Um, on the IT team side, it, it's a big thing to get your IT support organization involved. And the thing we often do is we often get Link rolled out to IT first because those are the guys that are either indirect or directly influencing the business. So when someone in the business rings up your help desk and says, oh, I can't do this with Link, you want the IT support team to be going, oh, no, it's great. Let me show you how you can do this and this. Not kind of going, oh, yeah, I'm not sure, but let me show you how we did it on BT Meet Me or WebEx or on the old PBX. And, and that stuff happens because they go to what they know to solve the problem to close the ticket. 
So getting your whole IT team on board with the, the vision of Link and the technology of Link and particularly the support teams is really important. And, and if your support team aren't using Link and they're trying to support Link, I think you've got a real challenge there, to be honest. Um, uh, last point here on the, the telecoms team, I talked about gateways in front versus gateways behind of the PBX. Um, this is veering a little bit into technical, um, but it's something you guys might want to understand that there's two ways to interrupt with the PBX, loosely speaking. We can have the gateway in front of the PBX, so i.e. you have a, a carrier, the gateway, and then the PBX. So the gateway almost becomes the authority in the routing environment. Or you can have the gateway behind the PBX, and the, the PBX remains the authority in the environment. Um, both have their pros and cons. If you're looking for a, a complete control from the link team point of view, or you've got the telecoms team on board, having a gateway above the PBX makes your migration much easier because the gateway controls the routing. Um, if you have the gateway behind the PBX, just be aware that you're entirely dependent on the PBX. And if your telecoms team aren't completely on board, or even if they are and they don't completely understand the ins and outs of a PBX, because Quite often, these things just sit and run and do their job. But if you find a certain call scenario doesn't work and your call's going through the PBX, the PBX can become a complete black hole to you guys. Um, so it's important to think about that decision and, and maybe even have an option to route out to the PSDN that goes through the PBX and an option that doesn't go through the PBX. That way, if you hit any issues, you can say, well, it works in this direction, but it doesn't in the other. Question. What if you have an SBC in front of both of them? Um, so if you've got an SBC in front of both, then that SBC controls the routing. So it's a question of who owns that SBC, really. Is it you guys, telecoms, or joint together? It, it's, it's really about making sure that Link doesn't get disadvantaged because it's going through a PBX, and the PBX breaks a call scenario. Um, any SBC uh, that's preferably certified but SIP compliant should work fine with Link, um, and that's usually easier to troubleshoot than a, a traditional PBX in most cases. Thanks for the question. Uh, business policies and decisions. Uh, this is something that I often see gets overlooked. Um, Link enables all these new abilities, and that's what we're selling into the business. You know, the whole work from home, work from Starbucks type scenario, uh, mobile devices, iPad, Android. We've just seen the Android tablet stuff, the Windows mobile stuff. It's all really cool, and that's the stuff that will get users within the business really excited. I, I lead my demos on the mobile stuff these days. That's the stuff that people want to see. Um, federation, collaboration, but be careful that you don't go in showing all this stuff kind of uh, without thinking about what the business policies will be. Um, so you have probably information assurance, information security type teams. Again, it's all about this engagement early. Get those guys on board. If they hear about federation through kind of somebody in the business saying, oh, I'm talking to this company and that company, my previous experience says they won't be impressed and they'll be harder to win around just on the principle that you guys haven't engaged with them early. Um, so you need to be engaging with those teams, but also you need to be engaging with the business to say, to kind of bear some pressure on those guys so they don't just, for the sake of saying, well, security, security, so off is the most secure, so we'll turn everything off, which unfortunately is the reality, particularly in finance. Um, you need the business to kind of put some pressure on those teams to say, actually, federation adds tons of value. It's making us faster to make decisions. It's working closer with our partners, with our competitors even. We, we're, we're communicating faster. We're doing things better. We need to seriously look at if this is secure enough for us, considering the business benefit. Um, it's a tricky situation to manage because you've got two different teams there. Often IT don't have leverage over the security department. Business users usually have leverage over the security department if they're high enough up. Um, so it's thinking about how you present your case to them in the most favorable way, um, particularly understanding the security ins and outs and maybe using consultants to understand or bring in with your kind of talk to the security team. So when they throw you some curveball about LS issue, you've got someone on your team that can match them knowledge-wise to say, 
actually it's uh, TLSB2 and this, that, and the other, and this is why we think it's secure, and, and here's three other companies that are doing it, that kind of thing. Um, so that's not to be underestimated, the, uh, the business policy decision making. Um, another one on that front is thinking about things like uh, monitoring and archiving, um, all those types of things need to be worked out early on. You don't want to be kind of rolling out inside IT and then finding out that actually your, your global policies state that you should be archiving IM and you're two months in and you haven't archived any IM. So uh, getting engagement early on those business decisions is really important. Link depends on a solid infrastructure. Uh, this is kind of the most true, uh, true statement in all these options. If you think about how much Link depends on, and there's been some sessions this week about talking about, well, probably just about everything that Link depends on. Network, DNS, you know, kind of Q QoS on your network, your servers, your hardware, your software, you know, your support, your antivirus, multiple teams probably, SQL team, server team, maybe virtualization team. There are tons of interdependencies for Link. Are absolutely loads of them, um, which you know. Let's be honest. This is makes it kind of a challenge to get this stuff working end to end. You need a, all those guys on board. It's completely doable, but if you don't have the SQL guys realizing that actually SQL is a critical component for your comms, and they decide to patch your SQL midweek, you're potentially in trouble. Um, and to users, it's all link. It, it, they don't. They don't care that the SQL team took down link. They don't care that the network team blocked the firewall and the firewalls blocked federation and now they can't federate. All they see is a link logo, all they know is it's link, all they know is link's not working. So as a, as a link project team, depending on whose members of your team are, you need to understand that your perception is on the line by all those teams. So you know, make sure you've got kind of allies and friends on those teams as much as possible. At a minimum, make sure you've got it documented that they understand how dependent the link comms infrastructure for your organization is on their services. You know, do the SLAs add up? If your link has a, a four-hour SLA in terms of you know, support, but your VMware infrastructure or your Hyper-V infrastructure has a 24-hour SLA on support and you're virtualized, you could be in real trouble because the virtualization has a wobble and, and you've got no comeback. So it's, it's really important to map out all the dependencies of the infrastructure. Let's grab a seat anywhere, thanks. Um, and make sure that you've got the relevant people kind of almost documented and on the record as to what they need to do to support you guys in the link infrastructure. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've called out some dependencies here in particular to consider that um, sometimes get overlooked. Uh, Exchange Unified Messaging. Exchange is a funny one because sometimes it's exactly the same team as Link and sometimes it's a completely different team to the Link. Um, sometimes Link will come out of one region, a global company, and Exchange will be managed out of another region. Uh, you, you basically can't do Link without Exchange UM. Um, I've seen people try and I've even seen people that didn't have voicemail on their legacy PBX, not do voicemail on link. But it, it just doesn't really give you the full experience. So Exchange Unified Messaging being an exchange role, you need the guys responsible for Exchange on board to make sure that their voicemail is working for your link users. Um, the next most important and probably arguably the most complicated is the network. Um, sometimes network teams are telecoms teams, particularly if you've gone IP for telecoms. Sometimes they're separate. But you need to think about, and there's whole sessions this week about network dependencies. Again, we're veering into technical stuff. So, so for kind of business people in the room, it's, it's making sure that the link project team have someone in the network team on board. Um, and particularly making sure that the network team give Link a level footing against uh, whatever your existing comm solution is. So quite often we'll see people deploy Link, and because it uses variable bitrate codecs and it's very resilient, it will get away without QoS in a pilot, for example. But you start to scale it, and it's not getting QoS, and, and say the Avira or the call manager or whatever is getting QoS, users get a bad experience, you're back to that slide from before. 
You can't tell the users, oh, it's because the network team aren't giving us QoS, but the other system gets QoS. All they know is they had a bad experience with the link. So uh, making sure you've got quality of service, call admission control, um, power over Ethernet for IP phones, um, often overlooked. Um, WAN and branch sites, that's, a, that's another critical one. How do you deal with your survivability of your branch sites? Um, and firewalls. The, the firewall rules are pretty complicated and making sure that federation story always works and, and uh, anonymous meeting join external users coming in. Particularly if you're displacing an existing conference solution, you want to make sure external users, customers usually to the business, are joining conferences and getting a great experience. Um, so uh, for the IP phones, they'll run on PoE. Um, so if you're going all headset, then it's not such an issue. But the reality is most deployments I do have some amount of um, IP phones. Wireless. Wireless is a real tricky one. Um, so interestingly, in 2010, kind of wireless wasn't really officially supported. It works, obviously. Um, in 2013, it is officially supported. But it presents a whole load of challenges. Um, it's, it's a shared medium. So you guys are all on wireless today. There's a few APs knocking around, and you're all sharing it. If one of you downloads a massive file, you're potentially impacting all the other guys on the wireless. Um, it, it's all well and good. or. Uh, even, uh, it isn't really all well, to be honest, but traditionally I've seen people say wireless isn't supported within the business. So if you use link, you have to wire in. That's probably the ideal situation, to be honest. If you can wire in, do wire in. But it's not the reality of, of today. My laptop doesn't have an Ethernet jack. You know, My Windows Surface, my tablet, whatever, doesn't have an Ethernet jack. I'm not going to plug in a USB adapter and, and do all that faffing around, o odds are I'm just going to go on wireless. Um, so making sure you understand if your wireless can take that and, and if you guys need to invest in your wireless to give the users the experience they need, and, and also where wireless might be used more than um, more or less. So conference rooms, for example, odds are people won't all jack in. Um, and if they're joining conferences, you know, ad hoc huddles where they're bringing in a laptop and setting up a link call, you want to make sure your wireless is particularly well covered in those environments. Um, there's some really cool technology kind of along now, Aruba in particular, um, but also, you know, uh, the other wireless vendors can do clever stuff around QoS-like technologies on wireless, so they can pretty much guarantee the experience. Um, it's not the cheapest thing to do necessarily. Architecting wireless for Voice and video is very different to architecting it for data. Um, data, you lose a few packets, it retransmits, life goes on. Wireless, you need to make sure that it's perfect for voice and video or as, as close to possible. Um, so again, network team engagement, thinking about how good your wireless is and where you might need to beef up your abilities there. Uh, desktop client rollout. Um, again, in big org, this is a whole different team typically. Um, and not to be underestimated, you get the whole link infrastructure ready, and, and suddenly someone turns around and says, right, how do we get the link client out to the first 1,000 users? Oh, we have to package it. How long does it take to package it? Oh, well, it takes eight weeks to package it. Nobody's thought about that in the project up to this point, because they've just run around IT and, and put the, the, the EXE on the individual machines and had a play. But actually, corporate policy dictates that it has to be packaged and checked and verified and all that good stuff. Um, so think about early how you're going to manage the client rollout, and how you're going to manage the ongoing patching. Um, we're seeing some, some really important patches come along now in terms of the link client, things that are adding features, adding abilities, fixing problems. You don't want to be left behind on the desktop side without patching for a, an extended period of time. Um, on the flip side, you need to be um, testing those patches and understanding them as well. Now, whose responsibility is that? Is that desktop team or is that server team? You need to think about those things. Do the desktop guys have the ability to test all the voice and video features that you guys want to test before they roll out that patch? So back to your kind of planning and understanding and working with multiple teams, very important. Um, device drivers, USB devices as well. Um, all the really cool USB devices you'll see around the show, the Pandronics, the Jabras, the Logitechs, the Sennheisers, um, they all have firmware and, and drivers. Anything certified generally will just plug in and work. Um, but 
quite often, again, professional services finances will have USB locked down, so only certain devices can work. Might be different in different regions and different countries. So you need to think about, and particularly test, do the devices we're intending to give our users work on our USB, with our drivers, with our desktop build? And how do we intend to patch those firmware on those USB devices? You know, is that something that, to be honest, a lot of people don't do that, and it's, it's not necessarily always needed, but there might be something that comes along that you want to upgrade on those devices. How would you manage that? Yeah, there's some stuff, there's some, the, the vendors are really stepping up actually. So um, I think both Plantronics and Jabra have MSI rollout installers that will push out and can actually upgrade the firmware at scale. Um, obviously, while you're upgrading those devices, you're impacting users. Um, I've seen people manage it in different ways. Some people have a um, kind of a, a rolling program with their, their laptops and health checks and stuff like that, and they just do it at that time. Some people just make sure that before they roll for the first time they've updated them, so at least from coming to manufacture to getting to the users, you've got the latest firmware update. Um, they, the, the firmware don't happen that often, to be honest, um, but when they do, you might well need them. So on to third-party components. Um, when I talk about third-party, I'm talking about third-party to Microsoft. So we're at the Link Conference, we're obviously talking about Link Bits, but yet, we've already talked in this presentation about probably a dozen different third-party bits and pieces that are important to you guys. Um, and it's not just the network. It's gateways in particular. Uh, nearly everybody's going to have third-party gateways. They're always going to be, or hopefully, they're going to be certified. So the vendor's gone to Microsoft. They've said, here's our firmware. We think we support everything you guys say we need to to be certified and work properly with Link. Microsoft will bat them back and forwards until they meet this criteria, and then they'll get a badge saying they're certified. Um, but also, room-based video, call recording, um, operator consoles are a common one, call bidding analytics, um, and even contact center. Those are not going to be Microsoft products. They're going to be partners that are working with your, with your system. Um, depends on how fast your rollout is and what you're looking to achieve but I bet most people in the room need at least one or two of those things, certainly gateways. Um, in, in terms of kind of ease to, to hardness, gateways, there's, there's lots of really solid options. Room-based video, now we've got LRS, there's some really cool options there that are actually kind of Microsoft code, but there's also some really good options from, from third parties, Polycom, for example. Um, call recording is something I've been working on a lot lately. Um, that was traditionally one of the real blockers for us on Link on kind of finance and, and professional services customers. Um, there's a good number of options now. So um, for you guys that don't know, there's a, a page called the OIP page, which lists all the vendors uh, under all the categories that are certified by Microsoft to be supported. So again, for those of you that aren't terribly technical, um, you can go to your project team and say, look, are we using components here that Microsoft have ticked off as at least meeting the minimum benchmark to be supported by Link? Um, for call recording, um, some of the ones I've been playing with are Actience and Verba, um, and they're doing a good job. We're, uh, we're seeing that we can now credibly solve the recording problem and push Link recording out to compliance users, um, which is a, a real step forward for us in terms of financial services deployments. Um, Operator consoles are another big one in terms of PAs and um, reception areas and operators are typically big influencers on the business. Um, both if they're PAs to execs or if they're the front line of your business. You know, uh, a lot of people still run uh, a team that answer every single call and, and are the front line to the business. If those guys can't transfer as quickly as they used to, can't put people on hold with different types, can't have eight queues with different welcomes from different languages, you know, you're, you're downgrading their experience if you don't give them a decent operator console solution. Um, hi. You mean the Microsoft one? Yeah. Uh, not often, to be honest. I've got that rolled out in two customers, and it, it works all right. It's kind of a minimum benchmark, but it depends on what you're matching to their current experience. Um, 
Yeah. I'm, it, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Yeah, and I, and I pretty much agree with that. So we've got it in smaller customers where all they want to be able to do is visually queue a few calls, and it does that job. But, but you can see it's a 2010 client, not a 2013 client. So Microsoft seemed to have made a decision that the third-party ecosystem is there now for that, and they're not making a 2013 version of that attendant console. Um, and it certainly won't do some of the clever stuff around different greetings and queues and, and um, different routing groups and agent groups and all that kind of stuff that the third party attendant consoles will do. Um, no problem. Um, so having said that the third parties are all certified and, and, and great, you need to think about testing for these products. Um, you, you're particularly, if you're using more than one, because your attendant console will be certified by Microsoft and your gateway will be certified by Microsoft, but has anybody tested the scenario with the gateway and the attendant console? You know, it's a, it's a relatively small ecosystem, so it's unusual that you're the first to do anything with any of these third parties, but for some of the cutting edge stuff, like the call recording, it might be. So make sure you, you build in a good testing cycle um, and when you're assessing these third parties, they're, they're usually really supportive. They'll be happy to give you the bits for your, your dev, your uh, end user acceptance environments, and, and have a play. Um, don't just look at the PowerPoint. Don't just see the demos. Have a play. Talk to reference customers. Again, if they can't stand up reference customers, kind of red flag. The usual standards apply. Think, think about how important these things are to your environment. The, the attendant console, the could make or break the link. It doesn't matter how good the link deployment is. If you're not meeting your business requirements or your front, front of house staff are really annoyed that they're not getting the experience they used to get, it can tarnish the whole project. So it's really important. Um, think about how, just like you've got a patching cycle for link, you've probably got a patching cycle for those products. Often those products will have minimum um, cumulative update requirements for their, their services. So they'll say, we've tested up to CU3 or CU4. Um, you need to think about how their product impacts on your patching cycle. A really good question for third-party vendors is how do they handle cumulative updates? Are they testing the moment they come out from Microsoft? Do they give you a six-month lag? Do they not even test against cumulative updates? I've, I've had all those answers from vendors need to be taking those questions to those, to those guys because your infrastructure is ultimately going to be tied to their supportability in the long term. Um, and, and on that note, think about who is ultimately responsible for the support of those products as well. I've seen link teams put in third-party products and not consider that they're going to have to support those products in an ongoing basis as well. It's all part of the link environment. Someone needs to look after those just like they look after link. Um, remember to consider HA and DR. Again, it's a, an easy thing to overlook. You, you get your link set up, you've got your pool pair, it's amazing, two data centers, you pull the plug on everything, the users flip over, it's all great. You deploy attendant console, you deploy recording. Six months later, something happens. Oh, actually, we haven't got the attendant console ready to go on the other pool, potentially. Um, you need to build up your, your complete environment and think about how you do HA and DR for not just the link bits, but for the whole environment. Very important. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, I've point seven. <laughs> Uh, is user experience. So if you're all right, I'll, I'll jump to that in just a second. Uh, you, you were almost there. If you just waited five more minutes, it would have been perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, no, very good question. We'll definitely come back to that. Um, 
so this is kind of a continuation of what we were talking about before. Planning uh, and testing, critically, critically testing HA and DR. You know, the documentation is, is pretty solid for Link. All the TechNet stuff, all the bloggers, all the, all the labbing. Um, but you need to, once you've deployed, actually test. And, and I'd encourage a regular test of your HA, DR type strategy. Some of my customers do a, um, a six-month blackout type test where they pull, pull the plugs and everything. We'll sometimes do a different cycle on Link where we'll just pull the Link components down. Um, you can't just have a documented plan and, and be ready to run that plan the first time things happen because something will, will trip you up, odds are. Um, think about the fact that you're replacing uh, an always-on service typically in voice. You know, uh, if your exchange goes down for an hour, okay, odds are someone's going to get a, a tongue lashing probably, but it might not be the end of the world. Depends on the environment. If your voice goes down for an hour, maybe that's completely unacceptable to the business. Um, on the flip side, maybe everybody's got mobiles, and actually it is acceptable. But you need to have ahead of time documented what your um, service level availability targets are, what your data recovery targets are, and make sure, just to cover yourself, make sure that you've got agreement throughout the business that this is what you're signing up to, and then make sure your architecture is correct to meet those goals. Um, think about if things go wrong out of hours, if things go wrong in different countries, if you've got gateways all over the place, all over the world. You know, you've signed up to a four-hour um, SLA on your link deployment, but you've got gateways in some far-flung place in Asia is your gateway vendor ready to drop ship a gateway in there? Do you have the backup of the config ready to flip onto that gateway? Do you need a local partner there to kind of help you out with that, or do you have skill in-house? Um, it's a very kind of holistic conversation you need to have about HA and DR, particularly in a global deployment. Um, it's not good enough until it's tested. That's so true, um, particularly when we look at the, the areas that are often overlooked. So. Think about your carriers. You, you fail over your system, do they fail over with you? If you've got a pool pair and you've got two data centers, are they able to send inbound traffic from one data center to the other or change the SIP trunk they're going down or change the ISDN trunk they're going down? It's a really commonly overlooked issue. People test their failover, yep, I can still make calls, life is good, but all the inbound is getting dropped because it's hitting a particular gateway that you've taken down as part of your testing or in your the R scenario. Going back to our earlier slide about the infrastructure dependencies of Link, um, particularly DHCP, DNS, certificates, all that stuff needs to be up and available in your branches if they lose WAN connectivity, in your backup data center, in your, in your different businesses around the world for Link to carry on working. Um, so it's very important to understand what the dependencies are and what happens if those dependencies drop and again, how they influence you. If DNS stops working globally, Link is in trouble. So it's a dependency for you guys. Um, if pretty much everything stops if DNS stops, in fairness. But don't let that mean that you haven't talked to those guys, whoever's responsible for that, or make sure you know you're responsible for that as a dependency on your Link service. Um, certificates on backup pools, again, another one that unfortunately we've seen in production. People build two pools, everything's great. They have 12 months expire on their certificates. It's always month 13 where something goes wrong, isn't it? Um, users fail over, certificates are expired, users go nowhere. Even worse if the CA is in the main site and you've tried to fail over to the backup sites. Um, and that's, that's the importance of regular testing and regular maintenance on your link environment. So my friend over there, user experience <laughs> is only as good or as bad as the endpoint. Um, talking about users and link, um, it's kind of a rubber meets the road type scenario. Their headset or their IP phone, and both are available, and don't discount IP phones just because it's not fashionable in the link community to have IP phones. Um, that's their experience. Certainly, you can get a wide range of, uh, of link certified endpoints, and that's part of the beauty of link. You have this really strong ecosystem. You have really, really good partners. You know. Companies that specialize in audio experience, say the Sennheisers, the Jabras, the Plantronics, the Logitechs, that's their entire focus. So they're not, they're not building 
link and thinking about endpoints. They just think about how great they can make these endpoints. And, and you'll find a real scale of endpoints from kind of, you know, your, your $30 to your $300. And they're all certified, but there's still a marked difference in experience between those headsets um, or speaker phones or whatever it is. Please don't use headsets as a way to make a massive kind of ROI out of Link. I, I see this a lot. People say, well, an IP phone costs us $300 and a headset costs us $30. So if we buy 20,000 headsets for $30, we're just making a massive kind of long-term saving. Our ROI, our project's great. But you're not giving the user uh, maybe a like-for-like -like experience. You know, Out of 20,000 users, are they all ready to go to headsets? And, and are some of those business users going to be accepting of a $30 headset? Probably not, is the reality. Um, on the flip side, if you engage the business and you give them options and you talk to them, and maybe you don't buy the cheapest headset, maybe you buy a nice decked headset or a, one that can sync to their mobile or whatever else, again, you're bringing them benefit. You're not taking something away and giving them something else. You're saying, well, actually, now you can do all these cool things that you couldn't do before. You, know, you can take this headset home, so you can work from home and you can work in the office. It's all about coming back to getting that user buy-in, and, and the headset is, is key to those users. So we talked about how do you deal with the rollout of the headsets globally. Um, that's a good question. It's, it's pretty easy, actually. Um, usually the SI, so Modality, for example, have done this, but lots of the other guys will do this as well, will work with DISTES. Um, there's either web portals where companies can kind of have, usually they have some kind of purchasing web portal. You can back that straight off to a DISTI web portal and they can drop ship the headsets. And they'll do that globally. Um, and you can make prearranged agreements about what the cost of those headsets are and almost kind of outsource that whole process. So we've done that for um, kind of tens of thousands of users over the course of months and it's worked really well. Um, so if you want to talk about who can do that afterwards or go and talk to some of the DISTs, there's definitely options there. Um, certainly, I'd recommend having some spares in-house in for each of your regions as well. Um, often, the headsets have uh, multi-year warranties on them, but you can always hold a few spares and then you can swap them out and send them back and get a new one sent in. Um, you can't have your users, particularly, again, talking about voice being critical. If their headset breaks, they don't want to be on a, a two-week wait for a new headset. It's not acceptable. Um, so all interdependencies. In terms of areas to consider, um, qualified endpoints, always qualified endpoints. Um, it's, it's so frustrating when you see uh, users saying they have a bad experience and it turns out they're using kind of some headset from their local supermarket and that's the real issue. And we see it all the time. The other thing we see all the time is people using their mic and speakers on their laptop. Um, interestingly now, Link's getting so much momentum that we're seeing certified monitors with uh, mics and speakers and we're seeing certified laptops that actually aim to kind of bridge that gap. But you want to be making sure as much as possible you're using certified endpoints. Um, interesting aside for those kind of technical guys in the audience, there's a, um, a CQM session, a call quality management session from the Microsoft guys where they have a, a SQL query and it can pull out all your calls over the last X days which endpoint is being used and which of those are giving the best to worst experience. Um, it's not in the default monitoring reports, but it's just a simple SQL query. We found that incredibly useful. Um, and you'll be surprised. You see, you might not get the best audio out of the most expensive headset. So it's, it's worth testing this stuff and understanding. Um, and the other thing to, to realize is users might not be using their headset in an optimal way. So quite often users kind of pretty much stuff the mic in their mouth if they can for some reason. Um, and, and then they complain it's muffly, that kind of thing. But it, it's easy to laugh, but remember, the users might not have used the headset before. They might think they need to have the mic incredibly close to them to pick it up. So help those users out and make sure that they're getting the right experience out of Link. Um, Bluetooth versus decked is a really interesting one. Um, technically, there's quite a big difference between Bluetooth and decked. Um, Bluetooth is, is on a very busy wireless band. So there's the, there's the potential for lots of interference. Um, and also, if you're doing dense deployment, so quite often we'll have entire offices where everybody's on a wireless headset. Bluetooth just doesn't scale like that because everybody's using the same band and they're all overlapping. And you can get kind of a really choppy, robotic, transformer-type voice calls 
and, and I've seen people go looking for days as to what the network issue is or what the, what the server issue is, and it's just Bluetooth and, the, and the, the calls are kind of clashing with each other. If you're going to be scaling wireless headsets, then look towards DECT. Um, there's lots of bands, there's lots of options. The, the base stations can be set up to say the users next to each other are not on the same band, for example. We can bring the, um, bring the power level of the um, broadcast for those base stations right down. Um, so again, leverage, leverage partners, leverage vendors, talk to them about what you're intending to do. Don't go off and order 1,000 Bluetooth headsets for 1,000 people that all sit within five meters of each other and then work out that actually that's an issue. Um, talk to the vendors about testing stuff. They, they, they're very supportive. Um, they'll quite often, if you've got you know, a reasonable opportunity for those guys, they'll ship you a bucket full of kit to have a play with. Um, they're all keen to help. I know they're all on the floor this week, so go and talk to them about that kind of stuff. At the very least, that gives you some cool stuff for your project team or your IT team to play with to get a feel for what's right for your business. Rollout, strategy, and planning. Um, we've talked about this uh, early on, but you are swapping out a business tool. You want to get it right first time as much as possible. Um, you only get a certain amount of time to impress your users in terms of experience, and, and usually it's the first, second, third call, you know, certainly within the first few days. So make sure you're not hitting kind of sensitive users first. Get, get your infrastructure sorted out, do your HADR testing, get all that stuff sorted. I tend to recommend, where possible, getting IT on board first. Usually IT are a little bit more understanding. Um, we have a concept we call friends and family, so we take the project team and take the immediate people that we trust outside that project team and get those guys on. And those guys give us really good feedback about what's working for them, what's not working. They'll be testing from home, they'll be testing on the road, they'll be testing in different countries so that we can get some good feedback in before we go out to kind of the, the hardened business users saying, yes, this platform is ready for you. I'm ready to kind of take your phone away and this is, this is the way to go. Um, big bang or gradual? Um, there's no right answer to this really. It, it, in terms of big bang or gradual, is it, you know, we've done a thousand users a week for 14 weeks, and we've done a, a year of IAM and presence, half a year of conferencing, and then a bit of voice. It really depends on your business. Um, when you decide that you are going to voice, you need to think about whether you're doing a floor at a time, an office at a time, a country at a time, or whether you're picking out a sales team or remote workers first. No wrong or right answer, some, some things to think about. If you're doing a floor at a time, but you've got a team that's split over multiple floors in a building or they're remote and local, how are you dealing with things like uh, team calls and, and sim ring and response groups and stuff like that when you've got some of them on the PBX and some of them on link? Um, you don't want to, again, be negatively impacting their experience. Do you leave their kind of hunt groups on the PBX and have that call linked? Do you have link call the PBX? Or do you work to make sure that as much as possible, um, and this is what I encourage, you take the PBX config and think about who you're impacting when you're doing the migration. So try and take teams at a time, not necessarily geographic floors or certain types of workers or certain seniority of workers, but take teams and, and groups on a journey towards link. Um, even more powerful is taking international teams. If you have teams that work across multiple sites or multiple countries, they're usually going to be very quick to understand the benefits of Link. They're going from kind of not knowing if the user is available or not to suddenly being able to spin up a multi-country conference. And, and going back to your understanding of um, telling success stories into the business, that's usually an area where you can have a big win. Um, set up for users arrive or with users. Again, we've done this both ways. Um, we have a whole floor walking team at Modality who do this kind of stuff. Um, and it's, a, it's definitely kind of a, a specialist skill set to be um, certainly patient enough to set up 400 headsets for users and, and be just as enthusiastic as you were the first time. Certainly not something uh, I don't think I've got the patience for. But do you try and set the whole thing up for them so when they walk in the door, they can pick up the phone and carry on working? Or do you set aside a day and a time where the first time they're going to use the system, you sit with them and set up their headset and set up their team call group and their hunt groups 
Um, a lot of people think about Link as being, and particularly IT people, about being really kind of easy to understand. You know, obviously you go to the bottom and right click and set up your sim ring group, and obviously you know what sim ring is because everybody knows what sim ring is. Don't forget you're, you're talking to users here who might not understand that stuff or might need a bit of hand holding. Um, if you leave them high and dry on their first day, then again, you're going to negatively impact their experience. So, important thing to consider. Uh, user training and user support. So, this kind of ties into the last point. Um, there's a lot to link. Um, I, and quite often I hear all the time again, another massive saving with link is that we can just roll it out and users get it and, and life's good. And, and I've seen that happen, particularly in kind of where the, the mean age group is quite young or it's a kind of smaller company. Everybody already understood kind of how IM worked and they've used Skype and they get it and life's good. Um, as you start to scale up these deployments, you're going to hit people who are scared of the change from their, their traditional phone to this new kind of software communications world. Um, they, you know, quite often the fear manifests itself in, I'm going to say this is bad because I don't understand it. Um, and we've had that multiple times where we've had people that are adamant that the link experience isn't, isn't right for them and isn't working and they're missing calls and they're, they have a terrible voice experience. We sit a trainer or an IT guy next to them for the day, kind of make it all a bit more relaxed to help them along, and, and they turn into big advocates. Um, but if that stuff is left unchecked, it can filter through the business. So you need to think about how you train those users um, and, and how you help them understand the benefits of Link beyond just what they're replacing. Um, so Link can do a hell of a lot. We all know it. Um, it can do the, the video, the conferencing, the federation, both the ad hoc stuff and the planned stuff in Outlook. Um, you can't expect to teach your users to do all this stuff in one go. It, it's just too much to take in. Um, there are edge cases, of course there are, but typically we try and roll out the training in, in a gradual way. Um, think about having on-demand training, um, but also in-person training. Video training is a great one. If you can get people to join a video conference to teach them about Link, they're using the tool to learn about the tool. It's really strong. Um, but think about staggering that training. So day one, get them up and running, get them comfortable, give them a week, two weeks, a month, whatever it is, then circle around again and say, look, you've got this now. Here's an opportunity for you guys to give us some feedback, but for us to maybe show you some new tricks. And, and don't neglect the fact that you want the feedback as well. They, they've had a month or they've had a few weeks. They're playing. Again, all the time we hear kind of people going, oh, I love Link. But uh, I don't understand how I can tell when somebody's available, so I have to watch Link for the presence to change. And it's like, well, you just, again, you kind of just right click and, and tag for status change alerts. IT people, consultants, you know, kind of, we think, well, that's easy and obvious. They haven't tried to right click to understand what the options are there. So you can, you can add some real value to your users just by solid training. Um, and support, um, so we talked at the first, first slide about making sure your support team, the, the first line guys that pick up the phone, understand Link and can solve those problems quickly. Um, something we often do is we support by IM as well as support by voice, um, and even video for that matter. IM support is really good because most users only want to know when they want to know, and at the moment they want to know, they want the answer. So you can do an extensive program of training, but actually it's, it's two minutes before the key conference with a key customer, they're like, oh, how do I do video? Um, so being super responsive to those guys on the help desk is really important. And, and that's going to be, again, it's going to reflect on your project. It's going to be the difference between good and great. If they're getting quick answers, support guys understand how Link works, and even better, they can desktop share and they can set something up for that user suddenly you're showing massive benefit to the users, whereas before they just had a phone call and they were left high and dry trying to work out what they had to do to make that conference start, that kind of thing. Um, another good one for support teams, where possible, get them into the habit of using the um, desktop sharing stuff to do general support. Use the tool, leverage the tool, um, so that people are using Link for more than just the basics, and actually it becomes a, a benefit to those guys, which in turn benefits you because they understand the tool better. Um, 
support is a, a specialist skill set. I think that's really true. Um, you need a team that understand this stuff, and you need to support, in turn, support your support team to make sure they're getting the answers through. Um, if they have questions, make sure, particularly you guys in, in project teams, make sure that your support team is getting the support they need to get a good experience to the end users. So number 10 is kind of more the infrastructure support and the, the ongoing lifecycle management. So I've said good support of the end users is vital. Good support of the link infrastructure is obviously just as vital. Um, there's a whole bunch of options here, and, and you need to understand where, where your company is at and where your team is at in terms of how much support you need. Um, I've talked to plenty of companies here um, this week who are doing it all in-house. Um, they have a, a solid link team. They have a grasp on the gateways, and then they're doing it on their own. Um, there's other teams that use Microsoft, for example. So Microsoft have changed their, their support stance a few times around Link. Um, they do support enterprise voice at the moment. So if you have a Premier contract and have the right boxes ticked and the right money paid, you can raise a support call on Microsoft around Link voice. Um, and that's important for some companies. They want to go to the vendor. They want the vendor backing them. Um, but there's also a program called um, PSLP, and that's uh, Premier Support for Link, basically, where Microsoft have taken a certain subset of partners, jumped through hoops and exams, have the right skill set, have, have the guys with the certificates to do the Link support. So that means a partner can go direct to a, a high-level Premier engineer if they have an issue, but they can do the rest of the stuff themselves. Um, interesting distinction to understand is partners can support, obviously, the whole ecosystem, potentially, whereas Microsoft will support the link infrastructure. If you're going to Microsoft for your link support, don't expect them to be answering questions on your recording solution or your attendance solution. Um, they're, they're pretty good. They'll best effort you nine times out of ten, but they're not contractually obliged to help you with that stuff. Um, and that's where often your vendors or your partners will come in, and you can get a wrap that supports your whole system, not just the link bit or not just the gateway bit. Because the reality of this stuff is, um, if it's architected right, it largely just works. Um, but when things do need troubleshooting, it's usually multiple things involved. It's usually a, a gateway and link, or a vendor and link. It's not normally just link. It's always different bits involved. So make sure you've got an understanding of who's responsible for what and which direction you can escalate in for those things. Monitoring. This is, again, critical. Microsoft do such a good job of providing the ability to monitor link. Um, and interestingly, a lot of PBXs aren't actually, well, in my experience, haven't been monitored because the users, once the phone goes down, everybody's aware and the telecoms team get on top of it. Link, because of the, you know, the abilities in the product, there's, there's a lot to think about there. So a small thing might go wrong. You know, there might be some issue about meetings that goes wrong. Everything else is ticking along as usual. If you guys are missing that issue and it's a couple of weeks where people have had bad meetings before someone bothers to pick up the phone because they think it's their PC and they can't be bothered to talk to support, they don't have time, you're, you're having a terrible impact on the experience of Link within the business. Um, Microsoft provides synthetic transactions, they provide perf mon counters, they provide SQL queries, the QOE database, just tons of ability to monitor the product. Um, in terms of pure Microsoft Play, there's a, a SCOM management pack that's really good. Um, so you, those of you guys who have System Center, there's a, a, a management pack that comes with Link that will pick out all the right information to monitor. Um, there's a whole bunch of third-party components for the, um, the third-party support vendors and, and monitoring tools. Um, there's also a, an online kind of version of SCOM that if you've got a current uh, support contract, you can have your on-prem link environment monitored from the cloud. Um, so worth looking into those options. Um, Lifecycle management, this is, uh, this is more important than ever before. We're seeing the cumulative updates now come with new features and new abilities. So from, from RTM to where we are now in 2013, we've gained spell check, mobility, some of the stuff that Gadeep was pointing out in, in the presentation. Link is not a set it up and forget type product. It's a product that you need to think about how you're doing your patching, how you're doing your ongoing management, where are you going to go when 
say the next version comes out, it's all very modular. There's, it's not like this stuff is complicated, but it just needs to be thought about. And think about the life cycle of not just the link bits or the gateways, but your other third party components. We're kind of getting into this thing where those of you guys that have an ex-Exchange background, the new version of Exchange comes out and you have to wait 12 months because all your add-ons don't, don't support the next version yet. Um, and we had this blissful time around Link and OCS where we were picking off orgs and, and you know, relatively cycling quite quick, quickly on the product. Now we've got to consider the, the call recording, the archiving, the um, compliance products, the recording, uh, sorry, the um, attendant console products. And again, push back on your vendors. Make sure you understand what their stance is when the next version of Link Server comes out. How long are you waiting for those guys to support it? What's their roadmap? What's your roadmap? Those two things align. So, summary. I think I've, uh, I've given you plenty of things to think about there, hopefully. We'll uh, try and summarize what you guys need to take away. Um, and it's really three areas. This deck's going to be available um, after the presentation. I think the recording is as well. Um, but here's the three things I'd like you to take away from this session. User buy-in. You know, this is, this is your business users. This is your internal teams. This is your policy decision makers. Let's make sure that all those teams buy in or at least, you know, are understand the benefits of Link. If those guys get Link, then the whole rest of the story becomes a lot easier. People will have conversations about how they achieve the support, how they help your team, how the business gets implemented, how we can enable federation. Um, support of the infrastructure. So you need a solid infrastructure to start off with. You need your network to be good. You need your certificate environment, your DNS environment to be good. You can't just deploy link and assume, assume all those things are going to be right. There's, there's lots of tooling to help you out there. There's um, health check type reports. There's network monitoring tools. There's network assessments. Make sure you have all that stuff in play before you're rolling out link at scale. Um, think about your third party components. How are you going to achieve those kind of key business case things, your attendant console, your operators, your recording? Think about those things early so you've given yourself plenty of options when the business comes to you and says, oh, actually, we want to massively accelerate Link because we're seeing it go really well in this country. Let's, let's, let's push it out. You need some of those answers in your back pocket. You don't want to be going, oh, actually, I have to hold you guys up because I want to find the answer. Um, and HA and DR, make sure it's documented, make sure it's tested, and make sure it's regularly tested. Last one is rollout and support. Um, your endpoints, making sure you've got the right endpoints for the right users, making sure the users are supported on those. End user adoption and training. Um, this is, again, where rubber meets the road. If your users aren't well supported, then Link is not seen as success. Make sure your rollout strategy and planning is, is all documented and, and is going to plan. Um, and think about the long-term infrastructure, lifecycle management, patching, supportability over the next 12 to 24. How does that get achieved, who's looking after that. Right, that's, that's me. That's me having got through all my deck. Um, we have about 10 minutes, I think. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's called the um, call quality management is what Microsoft call it. So it's on the download.microsoft.com. If you look up um, call quality management or network, I think it's network um, ass assessment kit or something like that. But they're doing a whole session on it here this week. Um, it's quite a hidden gem, actually. There's, there's about 10 different SQL queries for um, what you can find out, and they've documented where they're useful. Um, but look for the look for the session here and, and download.microsoft.com and look for cool quality management and you'll find it. Thanks. Any other questions, guys? Cool. Well, thanks very much. Um, I'll be on stand two three nine for the rest of the day. Um, if you want to come and say hello, you're very welcome. Thanks for coming out. Cheers. <laughs>